Thank you for so much. No, for coming in. It's such a great film. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm editorializing over here, but I'm going to let you uh, ask questions in a minute. But I just wanted to start it off with uh, how did this film even come about? And uh, sure. sure, sure, I can tell you. So, um, so this the film really started with uh, a, our, a producer who's you know listed in the credits, Demma Paxton Fofang. He's a, a young man who I met uh, through another project that I was working on, and he this was something he was working with uh, with Van Newkirk from the Atlantic, and they were doing Van had written a whole um, series on black farmers who, that you all can you can find it online. It's like an incredible piece. And they, um, and then he, you know, he came to me with the idea of making, you know, something based on that article. And I think the thing that I found really, uh, there's obviously so much to that article, but I think the thing that we found kind of the most salient was this story, which, uh, which about Lowndes County, which had really has really never been told. I think recently, what's interesting in the 16, if you all have seen the 1619 project, which it's out now on Hulu. There is another story about SNCC and their activism in Mississippi, but in Greenwood, but it's different than this one. I think what I found uh, so interesting is the, you know, again, the idea that this, I think, has been, this story and many others, particularly about SNCC, have been sort of deliberately left out of the histories that we are taught and um, because it doesn't sort of fit in the narrative, as Ruby Sales put it, really wisely, it doesn't fit in the, the narrative of the civil rights movement. Um, this was a movement that was predominantly black and there wasn't necessarily a redemptive movement for white folks in it. And I think when you look at what's happening in our country right now and the sort of, again, the banning of books and the pushback against critical race theory and all of the above, it's you know a narrative that we're, has always existed and we're seeing it even more, you know, again, being more blatantly pushed. So it was really important to us, I think, to that this story be told just because, um, you know, what happened in Lowndes County is this incredible model for organizing. And also, again, we have to uplift to sort of combat, you know, white supremacy, et cetera, and anti-blackness. It's the onus is upon us to, to be pro-black and make sure that we tell stories that, you know, again, that really fill out all the, the gaps that have been purposely left in our the history of, this, of the freedom struggle or the civil rights movement. So that's how the story came about. And of course, when it came to me, I, Sam is my mentor. I came up with him even though he's on a train somewhere and not, <laughs> like, and, and, and not right now available. But um, I came up with Sam and it was really important to me that someone who had the lived experience, he has, um, Sam spent a lot of time in Mississippi. He has family in Mississippi. I, I don't have that lived experience of being in the South in that time period, but Sam does, and you know that's his community. And so it felt it was really important to me to have someone who had that lived experience of the time period of the community um, to be, you know, to do this. Like it couldn't just be me. And um, and so Sam, after much pestering, <laughs> because he was like, well, whatever. Like he's done, you know, he's done everything from Eyes on the Prize, like the original Eyes on the Prize. Like Sam is, you know, this the basically covered so much of the history of the civil rights movement right, and the, the freedom struggle, as as um, as the SNCC veterans put it. But we, you know, but I basically we were able to convince him because he he knew about he knew about Lowndes County, but he hadn't, you know. I was like Sam, it's never been told the way it should, you know, it should have been, and with the depth that it needed to be told. So he agreed and came on board, and so that's how we. You know, we were able to put this out, and then Nkan Kwan too came on board we, to do the animation. So he brought the, you know, the 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 stuff that you saw in the film, where we, you know, the comics that they drew. We, you know, we brought those to life. Um, we wanted there to be some of the feeling of of that, the energy of the SNCC workers in that. So he came on board to do that. And uh, can you tell us a little bit how you came up when you say you were mentored by Sam and? Sure. What your career path was, because a lot of people here are emerging filmmakers. Sure, sure. So I started in, um, I actually didn't study film, which was, uh, I studied art, visual art and animation and um, 
and a bunch of other things. It didn't make any sense to like, you know, like think <laughs> couldn't ac wouldn't actually get me a job when I left college. But I think at the time it was called like cross-cultural anthropology. And then I did, you know, women's studies and, and um, you know, uh, I did a language degree. And so I did a bunch of stuff that, you know, I didn't quite know what it would turn into when I left. But, um, and then I was working for an animation producer, for an animation artist at Harvard. She was teaching at Harvard and I was living, my parents who were in Boston at the time, I was living in their basement crying and working for her because I didn't know how I was gonna how I was gonna survive. And then I ran into Spike Lee. He was teaching on the campus and it was at the time that he was doing Malcolm X. And I literally ran into him, like bump, you know, kind of past him on the campus, uh, realized who he was, turned around and went back and introduced myself because I had nothing to lose. And I wanted to get out of my parents' basement. And I wanted, you know, something I, you know, I loved his work. I'd seen uh, Do the Right Thing. I'd, so his, you know, I'd seen his stuff. So he actually, I think, took pity on me and hired me to be uh, an intern on Malcolm X. And so he put me, and he made the connection between editing and animation, which I was in at the time, and he, you know, sequential art. And so he put me in the edit room. And then that's how I met Sam, because Sam, well, we both there's Sam. We, we we fight about it, but Sam, I'm we met on Malcolm X. <laughs> we met on Malcolm X, but and then, um, but we actually worked together on on the next film he did after that, and Surviving the Game, which is sort of a cult film from the time. And then the rest is history. That's and I never let him go. I basically kind of held on to him since then, as he'll tell us. Which is the key to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he said, how come you know people when people ask. How you know we've managed this relationship? Sam has always said she was always in my ear, so that's very key. Like you know, just always being the first person, you know, to be there. Thank you. I'm going to segue back to the film. Um, you tell us how it came about. Uh, was it hard to get people involved in involved in the film? Do you mean like the local people? Or no, yeah, not at all. Else. No. Interestingly, the. The local people of Lowndes County have been waiting for a long time to tell this story, and they, you know, they feel they have felt, you know, they have felt overlooked, you know, in the in the struggle. Like they, again, you hear everybody knows, you know, thankfully about Selma, folks know about Montgomery, folks know about a anywhere that um, Dr. King was with his organization, you know, with the SCLC. Everyone, those those stories have been told and sort of uplifted. But what happened in Lowndes County has not, you know, and I think, and the, the folks of Lowndes County do feel that they have long felt that I think, you know, a lot of these places have benefited from that retelling of history, right? Because there is then things that come out of it, right? There's stories, there's, you know, there's coverage, there's also, there's tourism, there's like money invested to, in, into sites where things happened, you know, and it uplifts the community and that has not happened in Lowndes County. They have been left out of sort of the benefits of that, the telling of this history. So um, they were very eager, and the SNCC veterans are always eager. Um, I think again, they are very. They're still at it. They're still doing. The, they're still doing everything that they did back then, even at the age they are now, which is incredibly impressive. They're still organizing. But the one thing that they did say to us, Ruby Sales, who's in the film, as you all saw, and very impressive, and kind of intimidating too said to us when we first started on this, she said, whatever you do, she said to one of the producers, Anya, she pulled her aside and said, do not make yet another mediocre civil rights film. And we were like, Ugh. you know, so then after that, there was a lot of pressure because we were like, we were worried about disappointing her the whole time. We were like, oh my God, what, is, what does Ruby think? Like, what's gonna happen when she sees this? We've been fortunate. She actually was very pleased. She was pleased. So that's good news. That's good to hear. Um, I have more questions, but I'm going to let other people ask questions. And, and eventually, I would like to have Econ tell us how he got involved. Sure. Maybe you can do that now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so Gita uh, approached me with, um, there were several things in the film that they wanted to cover. Um, a lot of times with documentary, uh, when you're dealing with something that is, uh, a period piece, something that already happened a while ago, you have to, um, there's not necessarily a lot of footage out there. So they might have audio um, and a lot of stills. And what they wanted to do was to cover some of the archival footage 
with actually something that's up to date. And so a lot of times in documentaries, what's happening now is that people use animation to fill that, those gaps. Um, so Gita approached me about um, filling up some of those gaps. We wound, up, we wound up not using more animation. We wanted to use more. Um, um, and I think actually for some of it, it was a right choice not to use it. Um, and then there were some key moments that they didn't want to get. Um, they wanted to use, they wanted to animate um, uh, the Black Panther um, logo and um, the, the, the dove, which was like the precursor to, you know, what that image was going to be, the, uh, the symbol was going to be, and the comic book, as uh, Gita mentioned earlier. Um, they wanted to give that life. So, um, yeah, so she, she, she approached me, and, and um, I got a crew together, and um, they did a good job. <laughs> you know, um, it, it was something that, and the, the process was interesting because we didn't want to make it look like it was something too up to date. It had to fit that kind of crude artwork, um, and um, the, the marriage was, was really nice. Thank you. I'm, uh, we're about to be joined by Sam. <laughs> Sam, can you hear? Sure, I see, I see my, I can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> well, then, this is a good moment to start our Q&A, because he has limited battery charge on his phone. So, quick, question for uh, Sam. I'm on my computer now. Oh, you I got did? about 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Gita told us how the um, film came about and, uh, and getting you involved and that uh, you had been her mentor. So, um, we're now asking for questions from the audience. To you. Sure. Audience. Feel free. Hi, my name is Evelyn. I don't know if Sam if you can hear me or and obviously I think you can hear you can hear me fine. You gotta be you gotta be keep them JC. All right, okay, great. Considering how many interviews there are here, there's a bunch of archival interviews, there's some that are m very modern. How many interviews did you go through and how was the selection process? Because you said it's an untold story, people were eager to tell this story, but when you don't have like a, a basis other than the historical facts and a lot of people have passed away from that point on or they don't want to retell a story in a way that isn't right um, as they perceive it, how did you go about selecting the right people and building a story? You know, it's something that Gita and I, for many years and many different kinds of films. And uh, we had great producers and multitude. And we just reached out to the different people who were part of SNCC, who had been in Lowndes County. And uh, uh, the whole thing, Gita knows this, the process of making a documentary is not one individual, it's collaborative. And we had great collaborators. Okay, so I would say we had about, probably about 20 interviews. I mean, you're right that a number of the people were gone. Like, there were people who had passed away, but we were able to sometimes find their children. Or, again, we wanted, it was important to us to have people who had the live, as much as possible, who had the lived experience of the movement. Or if not, at least maybe their parents did, you know, so they had memory of it. So, and we, I mean, but then I think the, the issue, the interesting issue was, if you notice Hassan, plays who wrote, you know, Hassan Jeffries, who is huge in the film, but I think it's also because he had sort of the larger institutional knowledge of the movement and its his place in history. Like, we, we wanted people who had the lived experience alongside that. You know, he, we, we needed him. Ultimately, we would have loved to just have, he was amazing, so he, he, he was able to sew it together for us. The, the ideal thing is, for I think for us, is always to have people who, ideally it's told by the people, right? For the people, by the people. And if you can't, <laughs> but if you can't do that, then, you know, you bring in someone who, like Hassan, who has spent a ton of time down there. And was really, he was actually really instrumental in also connecting us to all the people who were still living. So that was really helpful. It, it, it was hard, but we, we, uh, we found them all. And then the edit process, you always, it's whoever, you know, tells the story best. I mean, to, to go off on that a little bit, so in terms of like, uh, not the interviews, but like the ar archival content, the footage and all that, how, how do you, um, how do you like deal with that? Do you have a plan in mind of like 
things you'd like to add on or like do you find things and then that dictates the story and like so how do you deal with like finding archival content for like uh and and put it together in terms of creating the story you want to tell well the first thing you gotta have is a great archival producer we had a wonderful wonderful very talented archival producer lizzie mcguinn she was extraordinary in finding stuff that i didn't think existed um county she was able to find a film that had been done by a a documentary filmmaker named Jack Willis, who's done great, shot great material in Lyons County. My big concern when we started the project was would there be material to use, archival material? Because, you know, Peter, both of us know that if you don't have archival material, it's really hard to make these films come to life. And fortunately, she was great. She found the stuff. And every time I see the film, I thank God for Lizzie McGuinn. <laughs> So just to build on that, so we first, you know, basically the, the way that we did it was we took the interviews. We first did a string out of the interviews because that gives you the story, right? And then you, you know what you need to cover it, right? Like then you, with the story, you think about, okay, we need shots of this or, you know, or that, or, and that kind of, that helped. Um, but and for a long time, as Nikon said, we really didn't think we were going to have anything because nobody, there was no, hardly any news out of Lowndes County. It wasn't covered the way that the rest of the, you know, the, S, the, 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 the civil rights movement or the freedom struggle was covered that the, or that the SCLC participated heavily in. So we weren't sure. So hence animation, we thought more of it was going to be animated. And then Lizzie discovered these films by, this, by Jack Willis. He said he was, I think the film was dedicated to him and who spent a lot of time down there. He passed, I think, last year or the year before, but really recently in his... His widow actually came to one of the screenings and was really like, was very moved. She made us all cry. We all cried. <laughs> we were like, oh. But she stood up at a screening and spoke about, you know, how she, she felt that his work was having a new life, you know. Um, but we were so impressed by him. It was very brave, too, what he was doing. Those archives are amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Other questions? That one. So, um, while I was watching the film, I thought it was really interesting how you guys structured the narrative, and especially towards the end, when um, Ruby Sales, um, she mentions um, integration being a burning house, which is a quote that I heard loosely from Dr. King by way of um, Dr. Claude Anderson. And I was just curious, why put that at the end? Because I, like, I think it was by the midway point of the film, from when SNCC kind of took over from the SLC, it was like it was, you guys were kind of like really leaning into that, or like it was coming and like going on a way, but like it was just like an undertone. So why put that part at the end, that direct quote? I was really like, that, that piqued my uh, curiosity. Sure. Do you want to put that to Sam and then we can fight about it? <laughs> hey, what are the end quotes that we use? The burning house. The burning house quote. Oh, we can't hear you. I was, oh, there. Can okay. you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a challenge. I mean, that was a heavy discussion between myself and Geet, and you know, Jess and Gemma. And I was quite honestly, I was a little nervous about using that as an end quote. But Gita and Anya and Jess and Demo, they were, were much more provocative than me. And uh, I, you know, I came around. I, I think Gita can give you more detail around than I than I can. Yeah, so we fought about it. Basically, this was a, yeah, this was a fight between Sam and myself and participant and Peacock and the producer. You know, like there was a. It was kind of a, a fuss because they wanted it to end on an up note. They were like, "This is depressing. What you know? Nobody's gonna want to see this, you guys." And but there is no. You, this is not a Hollywood film. We can't tie this up in a bow. Like we're look at what is happening in our country right now. Like you know, we are as polarized. There is like white supremacy on the rise. You know what I mean? Like the right is doing crazy stuff. You know, it's just it feels like we are in a. You know, we're kind of. It's like. We're, there's a backlash, right, to all the progress that was made. And, um, and I mean, we all know that democracy is not, right, democracy is not uh, anything we can take for granted, right? It's always a struggle. There's always going to be extremists, you know, in extremist factions in a society, but the danger is when they are part of the government, right? Like, as long as they're on the sidelines, they're going to be, they can, they're going to be there. This is a free, right? We live in a free society. But, you know, we are... I think the point of that was that we didn't, none of us felt like it, it was the right thing to do, to just kind of be like, and look, Lowndes County did great. Lowndes County is one of the poorest 
county is still in the country, you know? And there, so there's much more to be done. And I think what Dr. King was talking about at the end of, you know, as you all, you, as you may know, Dr. King, towards the end of his, you know, his sort of, towards the end of his life, unfortunately, you know, sadly, you know, we lost him so early, but he was really thinking about the economics of, you know, of, of racist, of like the economic, the, the impact, I should say, of racism on economics and the way that, you know, that folks are literally deliberately left out of advancement and purposefully, right? And, and I think the burning house quote, right? That's what he was talking about. A lot of, there was, it's it, poverty, like being this incredible issue still today. And that the folks in Lowndes County for all their organizing are still like in a position when there's, you know, the, there's essentially major land grabs happening and with corporations down there, like black farmers are, you know, facing some of the, the biggest challenges ever. So. So I think we, we felt, we really felt like we had to leave it like that. And it's a, you know, hopefully it's a call to action. And, uh, but I think what was, what was really depressing is that one of the, I think you heard this, one of the, um, we sent it to one of the, like a film festival, and one of the programmers said, you know, so is that end quote about climate change? <laughs> and we were like, Oh wow, like we have a lot of work to do. Like we were like, how do we, you know, like it was kind of like that was also, we were, yeah, that was, the, I can't, I, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say, we need to continue to work in this industry. But, um, but it was a little, that was a wake up call. I was like, oh boy, you know, so even more important to, to leave it in. I brought it up strong, no one who makes these types of films ever gets on that side of what happened after the that's one thing that I have a frustration with with a lot of the uh, civil rights documentaries that are out now. No one ever ever really talks about that part. So, you know, that's off to y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, Sam? Tell Sam it worked. Tell Sam. <laughs> <laughs> what he says it worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, I was wrong. <laughs> that's all it works out, you know. <laughs> you know, I was being a little too soft and Gita was being and Tanya and then were being a little more confrontational. <laughs> it all worked out. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Isa, and this question is actually for the three of you. I'm very curious to know what impacted you the most during the making of this film, because I know you have been making uh, civil rights uh, documentaries for a while, so I would love to know what impacted you the most. I'm going to have Nakan go first, because he's the most objective. <laughs> he didn't have to watch it as many times. Um, oh, wow. Uh, what impacted me the most? Um, I think, um, so, OK, I, I guess, you know, behind the scenes, there were a lot of, like I said, there were a lot of things that we were going to animate um, that actually wound up not being animated. So there's a, a, a part, I think, um, Jeffries is, Talking about, um, um, oh man, what's the what's the sheriff? Um, John Clark, and he's and he's talking about how he had to go into the county registrar's office and was like, you know, we want to we want to um, vote, we, you know, and he, he goes in, and so we started animating that, right? And seeing the visuals of it, we wound up not using it, but seeing the visuals of what that could have looked like, right? And like this crowds of people, you know, that really had an impact on me because, you know, we take a lot of things for granted, you know. Um, we, we've made a lot of strides, and then we also have still a lot of work to do, right? We have a lot of places that we want to go. So to think about demanding, I couldn't even imagine right now if there was something that this country didn't, this government didn't want us to have, I couldn't imagine walking into an office, a government office, and saying, we want that thing and we're going to do it. And then they look at you like, what? No, you're going to get out of my office. Like, you're, that's not going to happen, right? Um, and then more, you know, something else will probably happen as well. But so that really, just thinking about those times and, you know, like even sitting here, in this college, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of these people, you know, in the civil rights movement, like Stokely Carmichael was a college student, you know. Um, a lot of things were happening from college students that we look back and we're like, oh, these are adults. But these are people young. These are young 
people in their 20s. Some just might be a teenager right out of their teens and into their early 20s. So that really, um, um, that, that section actually really impacted me. Sam, Sam, what, what impacted you the most about making this film? You know, quite honestly, the ability to be able to get out of Laos County and spend such, you know, great moments with all the people down there, John Jackson, Lillian McGee. You know, he, quite honestly, just going south all the time, you know, below the Mason Dix line is always like feeling you know, like going home. And um, I treasured those moments. Those were just, just a big thing, you know, and as I get older, and I think back to my family, these historic dynamics coming from Georgia and Mississippi, Lowndes County, and those people have just feel like them. So that's why it's, it was, you know, I'm glad I, I'm glad I went to the project because it's, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was emotionally very satisfying as well. So, so I'll, I'll just, I'll be quick, but I'll say, so for me, I think, and I'm going to use a really dorky analysis here, but for me, to me, this is the rogue one of, you know, of the freedom struggle. Like if you guys, if any of you are watch Star Wars or are Star Wars fans, like the idea that this is what, you know, I think, I don't know how many people really know where that it was in Lowndes County, Alabama, that the, this party, you know, that, like the, well, I mean, it was not called the Black Panther Party, at, you know, for, but that is where the symbol comes from, and it was the inspiration for the Black Panther Party. I don't, I did not know that, and I was almost ashamed that I didn't know that, and I think for me, this, this, this story, this story really, t like, took, even though obviously there is the, you know, the story, the narrative of the freedom struggle that I learned, it kind of opened it up for me in a way that, um, you know, that, that, that I felt was kind of mind-blowing. And, and I'll, also the idea, it kind of, it takes the narrative of, to I think, what we, a lot of times what we've learned is that the, you know, that the folks in the South, you know, were, you know, this was, were, I, I think, somewhat like waiting for someone, like an organization to come in and save them, right, in some way. Or were waiting, like, that they were, there was sort of like, and that there was the idea of, the, the SCLC, which again was a radical movement at the time, you know, I'd take nothing from it, but the, you know, it was again um, sort of faith-based, you know, there was a dynamic leader at the top, right? Who, and the idea that this sort of grassroots organizing was happening and the SNCC organizers really took some of their, their leanings from like socialism and communism and they believed in a movement from the ground up, um, which is, I think a lot of the movements today, you know, this is a handbook for organizing that I don't think that I understood fully. So for me, that was, that was incredibly powerful. And also the idea that the folks in Lowndes County were, um, were organizing for as long as they were prior, were, you know, went out and sought the help of, you know, SNCC, you know, just again, to just for, to support them. They were already making their own plans. They were also, it was interesting to me too, because the narrative of the civil rights movement, they were armed. You know, these were folks who were willing to defend themselves too, and who pr actually protected the SNCC workers, right? Like that to me is not the narrative you hear. You know, you hear the narrative that, you know, an organization came in and sort of saved the people. This is the reverse, right? Like the SNCC workers were invited in, and then oftentimes they were being driven around, housed, and protected, and you know, and that these folks were like when you hear about the tent city, where folks were armed and they were fighting back, you know, like that to me, again, it's like the I think we are we're seeing something very different here. There's that's a, a, a different form of resistance that to me was really really important. It's important, you know, like we don't not to see this movement as sort of this monolithic experience. So okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, um, I would like to know what was the marketing strategy behind the film? None. <laughs> <laughs> None, <laughs> like zero. No, I guess, so we went to, so I have to credit Diane Wireman, who was with participants. We lost her. She passed away during the making of this film, which was really heartbreaking. Um, she believed in this film from 
when we brought it to participant. Peacock actually wanted it as well when we brought it out. Um, but we went with participant just because they had more, offered more funding and had more experience. But I think it was at a time, you know, they took, they kind of took a risk on it, you know, I think. They, we, we, we pitched it as this untold story um, of the civil rights movement and they were really intrigued by it. But as you may know, the market, you know, for documentaries, like right now there's a lot of upheaval with streamers. There was kind of a bubble for the last four or five years with the streamers like Netflix and HBO Max and CNN and, and you know, they spent a lot of money <laughs> and then like suddenly are shrinking back. So, um, and now it's, their interests are mostly true crime and, you know, true crime, sports and uh, like, you, uh, sorry? Celebrities, exactly, and celebrities. So, so we kind of snuck this one in before that happened. But you could ask Sam, did you think there was a marketing strategy? Marketing strategy? I don't know what that is. I mean, <laughs> everybody should just watch Peacock. Watch Pe Peacock, some Peacock. You know, I, you know, I don't really, I mean, listen, the idea behind these films, which from my perspective, is to have many people see them as possible. I've been I'm, I've been glad to see emails from people in the, on the team talking about getting to other colleges and communities. That's the that's the most important thing to me. If that's a marketing strategy, then that's what I'm all about. Can I piggyback off of his question and just ask if there is an impact campaign behind yes. the film and yes. what that looks like? So the, so participant has a very has a pretty robust uh, impact campaign. Colleges. Also working directly with um, organizers from Lowndes County to try to, uh, to there's, there's actually a website that you all can go to for this, which is LowndesCountyBlackPower.com. And so you guys can go on there and the, the strategy is listed there, but it's definitely, it's just, you know, colleges. It's also in communities throughout the South, you know, like small screen, targeted screenings so that we can, again, if people don't have Peacock, if people don't have you know, these are like, or can't buy it off of Amazon. It's available right now on Amazon and Apple, and it's streaming on Peacock. But just so we want to get it out to as many people as possible. And there's a lot of strategizing with the folks from Lowndes County to uh, essentially try to, to piggyback off this film to bring attention to that area to, and, and to build up, you know, like they, they're interested in a museum. They're into, they have that small museum that was seen, but to, to build it out so that there's more. Um, so we are also working with them to try to do that. So you've had a question for like an hour. You almost answered it. Was, is there a sequel to this? Is there a follow-up? You said there's still much more work to be done. And I'm wondering, would you take this film back to Lowndes County, screen it there, and get the responses, and see what people would do next in order to move forward with their, so their movement down there? There is definitely, we've screened it uh, for, for the, you know, in Lowndes County. Um, but I think the, the, I think the idea more than a sequel, right, was to, is to try to get as much investment as possible in the community itself. Mm -hmm. Like that's where we're going. And I think there are so many, and, and I think the idea, like as you would see, there's so many projects that we are, for example, there's, the 1619 Project, which is now out on Hulu, which, you know, again, everybody should watch because it's, uh, again, it's important. There's the, um, there's a, I'm working on a series for, uh, which is an update to Eyes on the Prize, the original Eyes on the Prize, so that's coming out. So I feel like there's, it's, there are sequels happening, you know, like it, out in the world, but I think we just have to make as much content as possible around these topics. And like I said, we're going to continue. The relationship with the people of Lowndes County and the SNCC organizers is long, you know. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, the, um, the woman who spoke about, uh, she seemed to be affected by emotionally uh, the story about the person trying to flag her down on the, on the road, which is, obviously a, an interesting story that could unfold. Did, did, was there much uh, hoopla or was there any kind of investigation or anything around, uh, around that particular circumstance? Not that we heard of. 
not that we heard of, which is really disturbing, you know? Which is, and honestly, that's actually, that's, I feel like that's its own film, you know, like, or that, that, the idea of that. But as he's noticed, in, and Sam can maybe speak to that, but in Lowndes County, they say it was known as Bloody Lowndes because people just disappeared regularly. You know, it was just a, a known thing. Will you, will you um, ask Sam to speak on that? Well, it was a community that, you know, black people suffered because of segregation, that you can lose your life. You know, the thing to remember about Bloody Lowndes, I think you gotta create, you gotta understand the context. This is the South. That kind of stuff of black people being lynched and murdered in Bloody Lowndes, same thing was happening in other parts of Alabama. The same thing was happening in Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia. I mean, this was the height of segregation and, and, and violence against black people. So Lowndes is it's symbolic of what was happening in other Southern towns in the South from the year, from after Plessy versus Ferguson, all the way through the 1960s. So, you know, I think if you want to understand the history of race in America, a book like Bloody Loud is difficult to read, but there's so many other books that that takes into, you know, the, 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 the craziness and the intensity of Black people being murdered and lynched in the South, in the, in the, in the 20th century. You know, it's, 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 it's a great history for people to understand what America is all about from my perspective. I, I just want to add, though, that what was, you bring up a point with the, so the two sisters who are in the film, the two white women, we actually struggled with that story because they were, they still have ties to Lowndes County, right? They, are, they have family there. They were close with the um, Tom Coleman, the sheriff who, you know, murdered, um, who shot at Ruby Sales and killed, you know, her, her friend, you know, the civil rights worker who had come down. They, they basically his, like, it, what, Jonathan Daniels. The, so, you know, he, he killed him, he got off. Like, they were, they, I think, and there was even, I believe, a marital relationship between their family and his. Um, they had decided to speak to us just because they, they had done, I think they were carrying a tremendous amount of guilt, particularly the, the, um, the sister who was, you know, that was, again, was in the car and, you know, basically caused the murder of this young man, you know, she and her friend. So I think the, they, she carries, now she's purposely doing a lot of anti-racist work and she had, she, well, everywhere she, when she goes to rallies, she has his name on a sign, um, the, the young man who was murdered. But I think for us, what was really challenging about them is that we didn't want them to take up too much of the film. Like, again, it was not their story. It was, but we wanted them, we, and we, we went back and forth about it. We struggled with it because we were like, should we have them in at all? You know, like, is it wrong to have them in? Are we, what would, what would Kwame Ture say? <laughs> you know, like, what would Ruby say? But like, I think the, ultimately we just thought it was important because they set the tone for what it was like, like what that divide was like. You know, like they thought it was an idyllic place to grow up. Meanwhile, you know, in the black community, it's being referred to as bloody lounge, you know, and there's like a, you, you know what I mean? Like if you go to vote, you get, you lose your house and you end up in a tent city. Like, but just that, and I think that divide in our country is still there, you know? Like even the conversation, right, about like, the police, you know, like you cannot even today, the conversation of what that reality is for us versus what the reality is for other folks, you know, there's this, this incredible gap in understanding still. So we kind of felt it was important to have them and, um, and but tried to keep out as much of the, their, um, their guilt as possible because, because it was, we didn't, again, we didn't want them to take up too much space. I have one other thing I wanted to, to ask of you, uh, the filmmakers. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy where you have the, the intention to, to create fear, a climate of fear there, uh, and the response is obviously weaponizing, you know, and protecting yourself, self-preservation, those people that live there. And then Stokely, Stokely coming in, out and not exhibiting any kind of uh, 
outward fear at all and saying, yeah, it, you know, he's not blow your head off. That's a great quote. And he says, well, I'll integrate hell then, you know, which is absolutely great, great. So I'd like to hear the, uh, your experience in, in, or your feeling about experiencing it, that dynamic and did it, did it uh, move over or did it still exist or did it bleed into some of uh, uh, the individuals that partook in the experience? Sure. Well, I, you can actually, this is a good question for Sam. Did he feel that, I think the question is, did Stokely's sort of fearlessness bleed over into the community? Or was the community already fearless? Well, I, I think his boldness showed that he understood that you had to be aggressive. But remember, he was a northern Negro. He wasn't a southern Negro. So he came from the north with a different kind of attitude. So a different attitude than Ralph Abernathy and Dr. King. So there was a certain aggressiveness that he brought to the table because he came from the North, which was took a lot of gumption. The thing to remember, oh, with most people, I was kind of like John Jackson and others, seeing a young man like Stokely with that sense of empowerment was re refreshing, was really refreshing. Because it was some dynamic energy coming to that community saying, we're here to support your right to have the right to vote. We're, help, we're here to help empower you. That's refreshing. Pressure, you know, and that's why he was so frightening to people outside of Lowndes County, even within the Black Civil Rights Movement, because he was aggressive. But remember, that aggression came from being a Northern Negro. <laughs> Can I speak to that point, please? Yeah. Because uh, I was his assistant, so oh call me to raise assistant for many years. We started in the 70s. Okay. I, was, I was a young teenager watching him on, on TV. What I want to counter to the issue about being a Northern Negro, Negro is that I know the Bronx where he grew up. I grew up in there. And there's another misnomer about what black, white racism was in the North because you fought every day and he had to fight every day. So it wasn't about that he had an arrogance because he was from the North. You know, we, were, we had to fight every day for our lives, okay? So it might not, you know, you might not have been brought out and lynched overnight, but it was very close to that. So I do have an issue with that. I think that that fight, that's why I'm still an activist, that fight that I had to do every day, you know, and also he was my mentor, is why I'm still in the struggle today. Okay, so my other thing I want to say is that I really appreciate the footage that's, that, that he's in the film as much as he is because there's a, what I believe is an attempt to denigate his involvement in the struggle oh, absolutely. because of his politics. Absolutely. You see? And so to have a film and to see, you know, his involvement and what he really did, I really appreciate that. No, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for that. Now, so yeah. for, I think I just want to add, so what we know about him, and such an honor to have you here, but he was from, originally too, before that he was from Trinidad. So he was Trinidadian came up here, he went to Bronx Science, right? And he's, so he's, um, this is somebody who, I think too, uh, again, the, the difference in his, you know, the or type of organizing he saw, the leanings were, again, they weren't necessarily um, based, faith-based, right? It was based in, in theories that, um, again, of, of maybe leaning a little bit towards, you know, socialism, like theories from all over the world, right? Like that built his political, that's right, and Pan Africa, which came later. He changed his name to Kwame Ture. But I think the, I think but for- even with and SNCC, you know, there's always been the politics. It's always mentioning his name and saying, oh yes, he was part of Louds. But see, when he was sick and fighting cancer, he sat there and he told me those stories. You That's know, so beautiful. Which is something I we're really gonna treasure. To, we're gonna need to talk to you after that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so. You might be the problem. So I really, you might be you know, the I didn't know what to expect, but when I saw as much and, and, and the old footage of him, yeah, you know, that so, really touched me. Yeah, but he was also, he was in North. He was a Northern Negro. I mean, you well, that's where you get a different kind of fight. He's from Harlem, so there you go. <laughs> Harlem, Harlem, Bronx, Bronx. <laughs> I'm going to have to jump off, folks. I'm getting ready to get off my train. I really want to thank you. All right, I'm gonna, thanks, Sam. I'm going thank to thank you all for coming to the screening. Um, tell all your friends to watch it on Peacock. It's on there now. You know, tell your friends to bring it to the schools and the community centers and their colleges. 
the film should be seen. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Now, I, the only, I think the, the last thing I just want to say about um, Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Tour is that I think we absolutely believe that he has never received his due um, and for his contribution to the freedom struggle. And actually, I should say this to you, the follow-up is we're trying to do a film about him. So I, I should speak to you. <laughs> and, the, and then um, that is a follow-up. It's not necessarily Lowndes County. Lowndes County is part of that. But I think, again, because he was considered, I mean, Dr. King was also considered a radical. I mean, the FBI investigated him. We know that. He was radical for his time. And, you know, um, St Stokely or Kwame Turi came after him. You know, so, again, and was part of a younger movement that was tired of, you know, sort of the older, the ways, there, the SCLC's ways of doing things. But I think he absolutely uh, has been, again, because he didn't, didn't fit into the sort of, white dominant narrative that, you know, of, of the movement, you know, that was sort of, again, um, made palatable uh, for, for, again, like kind of a, a white-led education system that he has been deliberately left out. And I think this is, and but SNCC has in general. I think you, they show like we, we, we see the lunch counter sit-ins and we see the things where SNCC participates in nonviolent sort of action that, fits in, you know, with, again, a safer narrative, but Lowndes County is not safe to, you know, Lowndes County, like I said, they were armed, so nobody wants to hear that. That's not, they don't want us to know that. They don't want us to know that, you know, and Stokely was deemed a radical, you know, and then basically driven out of the country, you know, for like, so there is, um, I think that it's really important for us to question even, you know, how our history is being taught to us, and Ruby says it in the film, she says there is a danger in letting people rewrite your narrative, you know, and tell you what you're fighting for. Because, you know what I mean? Again, then that's what's been the civil rights movement and or the freedom struggle has been rewritten for us. And we have to remember, you know, we again we have to look for the truth in it for ourselves. So are we at forgive me, are we out of time? I, I'm sorry, maybe we'll take, take just because we haven't heard from her. It wasn't so much a question, but when you mentioned about when Stokely stood up to them and, and what were the, the community's reaction, terror, freaking terror. A black man does not stand up to a white man back then, and it's still there. I lived in Mississippi for 12 years. I'm from Westchester County. I lived in Mississippi for 12 years, and I married a Mississippian, and that, that, it's still there very, very prominently there. And it's going to take the people, not an outsider, it's going to take the people who are living there to stand up and, and, and make those changes because they're very skeptical about outsiders, yes. unless a new regime is taken up. They're extremely skeptical about outsiders. And they, I was always asked, well, when are you going back to New York? When are you going back to New York? And I stayed there for 12 years. And it's incredible. The, the, the old little states below the Mason-Dixon line, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I, th I think that what was so interesting to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but what, you know, what we learned from these folks is that the, I think the folks who were, who were organizing in Lowndes County, right, because they, like, they all, like, the idea that, you know, as, as Catherine, Miss Catherine Flowers said, that, you know, they had guns. Like, they were, you know, like, they all had guns and they were used to defending themselves, you know? And they, when the SNCC, workers came in, they were kind of like, they wanted them there, but at the same time, they were kind of like, y'all have no idea what you're doing. You all have no idea what you're doing. You know, we have to, they saw them as, as kids they had to take care of. But I have to say, one of my favorite things, too, is the interaction between the community folks and the young people of SNCC, and the idea that, like, the women particularly, I just want to say that the women, too, were an incredibly important part of this movement, and the women never get enough to, along with, you know, with, uh, with, with Stokely Carmichael and along with, you know, the women, I think it was really important to, for us in this movement to feature them, in this movie, to feature them as much as possible because they were, you know, I think um, someone says it in the film, for every, for every man there were five women, you know, and like Ruby Sales was 17. She was 17, you know, and she said that she was in when she heard what Stokely had to say to the sheriff, you know, so that tells you like, 
you know, how brave these folks were and how young. One question on local folks with guns. You all stressed that quite well in the film. And one of the television interviews that Stokely, Kwame did, where this obviously white reporter was grilling him about his student non-violating coordinating committee. And he says, yeah, I'm sitting with you and I'm non-violent. I'm non-violent now. I'm non-violent now. <laughs> That's my favorite. I mean, for right. me, I'm, my sense is he was non-violent pretty much maybe even in Mississippi. But when he got to that county where those folks all had guns to protect themselves and told him, you can't drive these roads at 3 o'clock at night without a gun, I believe that's when Stokely says, I'm nonviolent now and here, but if somebody's coming after me, a different story. I believe that was a result of his stay in Loudoun County. It, could, it, may, it may be true. It may be true. Last thing, because when he had got locked up, what, about 27, almost 30 times before he stood on that car. And, uh, you know, when they put him in that jail, they didn't just serve him tea and crumpets. They beat his ass. And so he even told me, he said he got tired. And after he got beaten that last time, that's when he stood on that car. So it wasn't no easy fight for him. Okay, on that note, I'm I wanted to ask Sam a question, but I, I wonder if you... You'll have to settle for me. I'm, I'm going to settle for you. Yeah, <laughs> for you. You had said he had lived experience with this area. Sam, yeah. Yeah. So what, what did he know growing up sure, about sure. this? What so, did it mean to him? And I'm wondering how he might have seen it differently going back now. Sure. So similar to the, to the, um, the, the lady in the back who was speaking about living, you lived in Mississippi. So Sam was born in Harlem, but his family is in Mississippi, his grandparents, aunts, his, fa his parents are from Mississippi, so they moved up here. And then he was, uh, so he was born in Harlem, but every summer, and I think it's a traditional thing, right, a lot of folks, he was sent back for the summer to Mississippi to the grandparents to get rid of him, I think, because, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like childcare, like, you know, they shipped him back to Mississippi. So he, he grew up down there. Like, he spent every summer down there, and he still has a lot of family down there, all his cousins. But, um, and he tells a funny story of how when he first went down there, if Sam was here, he was like, when he first went down there, he just, he, he couldn't figure it out. Like, he was so lost and confused, and he didn't understand anybody because of the different accents, and he was just like, you know, but he, and then, but so, but he was, he, Sam was, you know, lived through the 60s, obviously, he's um, a bit older than I am, and so uh, that's, that's what I mean, like he was alive through the civil rights movement, you know, and was he, aware of the he was not aware of Lowndes County, he was aware, to, aware of the work that was happening and the struggle in Mississippi, but he knew about Lowndes County later. He worked on Eyes on the Prize, and he, so he heard the stories of Lowndes County. And Lowndes County has been featured in some civil rights documentaries, but it'll, they'll touch on it. it. There has never been anything in depth. Um, so, so yeah, but he, but he feels very close, obviously, to this. Any, again, the, the communities, again, just the life down south and the, the community down south, he feels, um, you know, like, like he has, again, the, the lived experience of having been, you know, actually, like I said, lived down there um, and grew up there as a kid. So, which I am fully northern, d don't have it. So, and, and thought it was inappropriate for me to direct a film that, you know, like I was like, again, representation is everything um, behind the camera as well as in front. All right, well, thank you again, both of you and Sam, who's now gone for a great job. <laughs>